Welcome everybody to the Real Deals Podcast, one of the top real estate investing podcasts on iTunes for the last seven years. This is the place to be for investing strategies you can actually use, expert interviews, and of course, some good old fashioned entertainment. Now, here's your new hosts, Elliot Smith and Cole Rudd Johnson. What's up guys, Elliot Smith, Cole here. Hey, we had a great podcast interview today with our man, AJ. Um, but right now we're going to kind of do some housekeeping items, talk about what's going on in our business, our world, uh, what's going on in Call Magic, and then kind of let you know what's going on in the show today. So Cole, what's going on with you, your business, Call Magic, texting, what's what's going on, man? Not much, man. Just, just cranking away. It's a, It's been a pretty crazy September, early October for us. We're uh, getting about two deals a week under contract right now. Um, we just hired a new guy, hired a new transaction coordinator, hired a, another lead manager. So we're hiring like crazy. We're, um, we're marketing like crazy, doing deals. So it's going well, man. Uh, tell me about one deal you guys tied up last week. Oh, last week. Maybe still some uh, numbers, rundown situation, kind of. I got uh, one I'm more excited about that we got actually just today. It's, um, it's a deal in University Place, Tacoma. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll buy it ourselves, hard money for about uh 250 and uh, we'll literally do nothing to it we're not going to touch anything and we'll throw it on the market for about 360. Nice. Um, so, so it should be you know it's a solid deal nice nice little whole tail how'd you get that how'd you get that deal that was actually a cold call lead nice how long from like start conversation to end to come end to, to inked up how long did that take i haven't checked for that one um but I think it's been in our system for a little while. It's been a lot of nurturing on that one. It was supposed to be a listing. So that one was originally going to be a listing because it was in really good condition. And then um, ended up the lady who understood and she was going to take the equity hit for ease of process, ease of transaction, and um, decided she wanted to go uh, the off-market route. Cool. Awesome, man. So here's what's going on with us. Uh, I made a like a basically a $1.8 million offer today on some dirt um on the west side um so that's interesting we'll see i always tend to rabbit hole myself with these dirt deals i gotta make some one happen so um offer on that one um we tied up that probate last week we're working on our financing on our eight unit um just trying to get that thing going and then um other than that dude i don't know about you but like i've had leads like pick up like crazy this week we didn't we've gone on five appointments this week no rhyme or reason. I mean, we got some leads from cold calling and text messaging, but some of them are from like old direct mail leads. People call us like we went on three appointments on Monday. We've gone on two other appointments this week and it was Wednesday. This is Wednesday when we're recording this. We didn't go on, we didn't go on five leads in two days and bring all of September or August. I mean, we went and so it's, it's just weird. So guys, if you're oh, out there and you're not freaking getting deals right away or the leads aren't coming in, just know it freaking cycles. Um, so yeah, it's uh, I mean, a couple good, really good deals that we made offers on and, see so oh, that's awesome yeah awesome cool man well uh um what do you uh why don't you talk about the show we talked about today aj kind of give people a little idea of what they're going to be yeah, hearing so so points. we got aj on today i met aj uh, a little over a year ago um july 2019 in uh, in maui at, a, at the brandon's maui mastermind and uh right away i knew he was probably the smartest guy in the room this guy is just a business operations mercenary i mean he has businesses and technology e-commerce real estate he's has the best selling self storage book on amazon right now um and it's just an awesome story because he actually um almost passed away in yeah a couple he, of years. he talks about almost dying in there yeah. where he was on life support and in the hospital for four months yeah and it's just it's a true story of what passive income does i mean so we hear so much about passive income rentals um and real estate but this is a story where you know, if he didn't have his portfolio, his family would have been on the street pretty much. Yeah. Uh, and they would have lost everything. So it's, it's a real story about that. And he's a, he's a real authentic dude. And we get into some great stuff that um, whether you're just getting started, whether you're in self storage, multifamily, single family, just his business mind applies to so many different um, avenues. Nice. Yeah. And then he's also using our call center. Uh, we're pumping out a ton of leads. He's building a wholesale business. Talking about that. He's using our cold calling our text messaging platform. Uh, you know, call magic, you know, a little update on call magic. You know, we started this really ramping it up. I know you guys been here at probably about two months now we've grown it. I mean, considerably we've, we basically almost tripled the amount of agents we've had in the last, uh, in the last two months. So 
we're growing. We're going. Cole and I are going to Tijuana next week to um, to look at putting a center down in Tijuana. Um, so wish us the best. Hopefully the cartel doesn't uh, um, do anything to us too bad. <laughs> um, so doing that, um, we we started beta testing uh, text messaging or getting the text messaging service done for you. Text messaging service out this week. Cole, you've been dealing with those guys a little bit more. What are we seeing on leads? What are we're we seeing? Want? We're seeing great lead flow um, in the innovative group for the our text messaging platform and that and that service we're providing. I mean, the guys, we got a guy in Oklahoma City is getting about eight leads a day, and a guy in Spokane is getting you know five day leads a day. So it's uh, it's definitely working. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. So um, super pumped for that. That that cold calling we sell basically in every market. The text messaging. It's very uh, hard to implement with our backend processes, our systems. So we're limited to certain markets and a certain amount of people, um, you know, reach out to us about it, but we're not just letting everybody in. We're probably only letting five or six people in at a time across the country to make sure that we're, we're fully focused on them, making sure this, this lead source that works really well is working really well for them. So, all right, guys, enjoy the show today. Uh, leave us a like and review on uh, Facebook, uh, share the podcast. Other than that, let's get into it. All right, Real Deals Podcast listeners, I want to talk quickly about our show's sponsor, Iron Bridge Lending. If you guys have not reached out to Iron Bridge already to talk to them about funding some of your upcoming flip projects, I highly encourage you to do so. I've known the owner of Iron Bridge for a very long time. I've personally borrowed millions of dollars from them over the years to do a number of different projects, and I can say without a doubt, they are the best hard money lending company I have ever come across, and that is the reason why they are the sole sponsor of this show. I've had a lot of other companies reach out to me and want to sponsor this show, but I just won't do it. I feel like I need to be genuine in who we have sponsoring the show, and it needs to be somebody that I've personally done a ton of business with. So I personally vouch for their ability to be the best, hands down, in the world of hard money lending. You won't find better programs, you won't find better terms, and they're lending or will be lending in over 20 states. So chances are, if you're hearing this in whatever state you're in, it's definitely worth it to check out their website, reach out to them, see if they're lending in your state, and if they are, I would absolutely encourage you to do business with them. Another very cool thing to note is that they have a program for most rehabs where you can actually borrow up to 90% of the purchase price. Now, this is given the fact that you are actually buying a deal, which if you're listening to the show, that means you probably are. But if you have an actual deal on the table, they'll fund up to 90% of your purchase price and they'll even give you rehab funds on top of that, which means that it only takes 10% down to get into a project, which is unbelievable in the hard money world. So, do yourself a favor, reach out to Iron Bridge Lending, have a conversation with them, see if they're a good fit for you and for your next project. I can guarantee you that you'll be happy that you did. Real Deals Podcast. Welcome, AJ Osborne, Cole Elliott here, third time. Cole, they let us back another time. I don't I don't know what he's thinking, taking over the podcast, but man. I, had, shit. I mean, I had someone call me this morning. They're like, dude, I don't know what changed the Real Deals Podcast, but I, I'm loving it lately. Yeah, yeah. It's because we got this good looking 22 year old living in San Diego. Again, any girls down there, SDSU, he's, you know, he's single. So anyway, AJ, what's going on, my man? I've heard so much about you from Tucker. Um, I know we spoke at Tarl's event. We just, I was out of town traveling, so I missed you. Um, so I don't know a ton about, about you. I know you're, you're a really good looking guy with a good beard. Um, That's you all you need to know. Boise Super, yeah. uh, area, I think. <laughs> and uh, you crush it in uh, self-storage. And you're getting into Cole built some systems for you, and you're getting to do some off-market stuff in uh, in uh, Idaho. Also, I want you to be brutally honest with how it's going for you, and then so we can kind of you can give us feedback on the podcast. So, hundred percent. So tell that us about yourself do. a little bit, and let's get into it. Yeah. So um, I'm that self storage nerd. Uh, I, I, I love the asset class. I, I, I wasn't ever in real estate, right? I, I came from insurance. I was the insurance sales guy. I sold insurance to like group benefits, medical benefits oh, nice. to companies um, and realized that uh, didn't want to be on the treadmill forever because that meant that I would always have to be selling. Um, but it, it was good learning from have to earn commissions, you know, as, as you guys know, that, that, that game, you got to hit the phones, you got to call yeah, people and grind. you got to track that. And, uh, but I, I realized that wasn't a long-term situation. So when we were looking at getting into real estate and doing something different, it really needed to be involved around our strengths, which the real estate side, I, I didn't really understand great, but I understood business operations, um, revenue management and capital allocation. So I thought, let's focus on this and, and self-storage just, it was, 
you know, this is early 2000s. And, and it was like, this is such an underserved asset class that um, most of the people that own it, they're just simple real estate investors. They really don't even want anything to do with it. And we could take it. And just by doing a little work, we could really turn those things around, increase the revenue massively along with the value and produce enough, enough cash flow to redeploy that cash flow and compound it out and keep going. Now you started um, early, sorry to interrupt. You started in early 2000s. You don't look old enough. You look like you were in the seventh grade in early 2000s. I, know. <laughs> you, I, got, a, I got a great picture to show you uh, of me <laughs> holding some, some papers. Yeah, our first facility um, was a small facility. I partnered with my dad on it, and it was 2004. So I was 19. Then I left, and I moved to Brazil and uh, came back, um, was going to college. We bought one more small one and then just stopped because the market didn't make any sense. So we're like, nope, we're just going to keep selling insurance. And that's what I did. And we just kept selling insurance because we couldn't make heads or tails of the numbers. I, I it, you know, it was during 2000, um, you know, five, six, seven, eight, you know, it was, it was, I didn't understand really what was happening. It's not that yeah. I understood that real estate was in a cyclical market where it was going to crash. No, I just couldn't make sense of the numbers. So I just didn't understand. So we, we had to walk away and I'm like, I'm not smart enough to get this. So I'm, I'm going to go back to knocking doors. Backtracking a bit. How important do you think that phase of door knocking and being on the phone and having to actively sell stuff and actively build that pipeline every single day and that side and that avenue in business how, how important was that to developing that those underlying skills that you're using? oh that was critical i i you know i i give any success we've ever had i i give it to really a couple things and you know my family being one of them because i think i was blessed to an amazing family and my dad who understood you know you got to go we're great we're you know we're from little old idaho we weren't born around really wealthy people. It was, Big you know, cities, my family's slickers, all farmers. Cars. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. When, when my family moved to Boise, Idaho, so we're from a city called uh, Burley, there was like 200,000 people. Right. And my family called us city slickers and I hunted out my back door <laughs> and we were city slickers. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was one of those things where we grew up in a family where it was like, we'll earn it. Yeah. Uh, we had a long history of farmers and you just get up early, you go knock doors and sell it. And that work ethic put into sales benefits you greatly. And, and a lot of yeah. fruits came up and then just learning that, listen, it's okay to fail and it's okay to look stupid mm-hmm. all the time. Cause I did every single day. I mean, I was out selling things. I didn't really even understand. <laughs> uh, and so I looked dumb a lot, yeah. um, but that was fine. That's what I was out doing. I, I had to make it. We're commission based. So that means we eat what we kill. Yeah. I didn't kill anything. I didn't eat. So I had to get out there and I had to hunt. And that was really important to, I think, install in me um, everything from the other businesses that we own and have started and what the revenue generating side looks like and then how to manage that revenue very carefully, appropriately and how to grow it. And your, your trigger finger in like in business in general is like one of the fastest I've seen. There's no fear. You're like, I want to do this. I don't care how much money it takes, time it takes. If there's an opportunity there, you, you just, I just feel like you don't have any sort of fear of, I mean, we can get into your whole, your whole story with what you went through with uh, becoming paralyzed temporarily, but how you told me in Maui too, when we met originally, you're like, dude, I have, I'm playing with house money. I have no fear. I don't care if I go back to zero. I don't care what happens. Like you play with such a, an edge and a, um, a lack of fear that I, I mean, I haven't seen it really anyone else to that extent yet. You want to talk a little about, a little bit about that? Yeah, especially yeah. going back to house money thing or the zero, because I I plan on, I agree with the plan on house money, and we're saying we always say the same thing, but we're still scared. I don't want to go back to zero. Yeah, you know I mean, so like <laughs> I, I I mean I, I mean I'll go down lower. I can get cheap, but like zero. I mean, so yeah. I think I, about- I think AJ, your your definition about going back to zero changed probably. Uh, changed a lot. <laughs> yeah. Or, or changed a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That that was a big change. Yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of, I'll, I'll break it down in a few things. So um, my idea of risk has evolved greatly over uh, the last little while, but um, I was in insurance. I focused on risk, right? Yeah. Very conservative. We focused on underwriting and working on claims analysis and you know what odds are and the viability of odds. So what are the odds of being successful and what are the odds of failing? And then two, what those odds mean and how reliable they are, where the data comes from, kind of nerdy stuff, right? Which... Um, uh, but that was good and it, it understood. But as I went through um, and as I got, you know, sales is it doesn't matter if I fail. I don't succeed unless I fail. Right. Correct. If you're worried about failing, failing uh, um, sales doesn't work. Now, although that's true, 
there's different types of failures. Okay. There's the failures that you don't come back from. Yeah. Right. And there's the failures that you're moving on your way to success. And there's certain types of risk. There's the risk of not doing, not moving forward and not getting. And then there's careless, stupid, reckless risk. Yeah. As long as you can avoid and understand the difference between those two things, there's no reason to not go all out. Like there's so just I have my not. wife. <laughs> she keeps me in check. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and, and too, I, it, this needs to be, before I even say, I, um, I bought a company and um, it went under and it was devastating. It was a huge acquisition in another state. Um, it was as stupid as it gets. And it was driven by pride and ego. And it cratered me. Like I was in depression. I, it was one of those ones where I'm like, we may, we may never come back from this. And uh, two, uh, my father was my business partner. So it was also their money. And it was like, oh, geez, I just ruined my family. I mean, it was devastating kind of risk. So I don't want there to be this thought that, oh, well, it's because, you know, you haven't failed or something like, no, I've, I failed on the cuffs of never getting back up again. And that was terrifying. Uh, I couldn't imagine. I, I invest my parents, my dad and stepmom's money. And I, I'm so leery to take like my mom, you know, she doesn't have a ton. She's got a paid for house. She's got, you know, maybe a couple, you know, some money in, uh, you know, some retirement accounts. She's almost 70, but I want to help her grow. Cause I, I have to, you know, I, what's she going to do long-term if the inflation goes crazy. Right. But it's so scary to like, if I fail, it's on me, not only for my wife and kid, but now it's on if I failed my parents. So I couldn't imagine like the heart. I've struggled with depression, suicidal thoughts, you know, anxiety, tons of stuff. I couldn't imagine going through that. So, I mean, could you dive yeah, into I that? I was worthless. Little? I was worthless for a long time. Like it was like just getting up and just going through the normal day was difficult because I felt like it was once again, I, it was not only that I had failed, but wow, I just failed my family. I mean, everything that they'd worked to build because my dad was an insurance salesman and he built a brokerage firm. And that's what we were doing. I was buying another brokerage firm. And so I'd done this before um, and I wanted to go out and I really wanted to grow our company. I'm like, no, we should become big. We should do all these things. And um, he trusted me to do that, right? And uh, we were partners. We were going at this together, but it was me that did it. It was yeah. my decision. Yeah. And so that made it even that much worse, right? And I'm like, wow, we just were, you know, we could take this whole thing down that we've been working forever to build and sales and, you know, cause sales, once they go away, they just don't come back. Yeah. And uh, so it, it was, it was a horrible, horrible time. And when I came out of this, I kind of learned my first lesson. First of all, um, I thought you can either get back at like, I, I'm too young to stop. Yeah. Right. And so do I either not take risks and so all we did is just analyze. I analyzed all the things that went wrong, why it went wrong. And it took a long time. I, I wish the people say, oh, I fell and I got back up. This drug on for years. This wasn't like, one of those. Okay, so let, let's, 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 it was, yeah. let's get granular then. So you bought yeah. the insurance business in another state. One, mm -hmm. did your dad have reservations about buying it? Was he concerned or have any things? You're like, no, dad, yes. I got this. Okay. Yes. That makes it even worse, right? That's even harder. Yep. Like, okay. Yep. It's like my like, wife saying, I don't think you should do this, Elliot. It's a bad idea. It. And then I go freaking do it and I lose money. And she's like, you should have listened to me. Like we got well, suited. And two though, he, 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 although he was had reserves, it was, but I trust you. But no, he, you know, it was just, he felt no, like it was like, oh, you, you AJ, that. you're a smart kid. You know what you're doing. And two, this other acquisitions that we've done, it's grown out. You're killing it on the sales. So he's like, it was almost like, you know, I trust you. And, and I think you can do it. Yeah. So really, yeah. Yeah. So, so, okay. So, so yeah. it's even harder. Cause like I got sued, you know, we had this, we made a loan a couple of years ago and we got sued for it. My wife had told me, she's like, Hey, you might want to check with a lawyer before you do this. And I'm like, no, it's fine. We ended up getting sued and losing. She's like, I told you so. <laughs> but, yeah. I, I ignored the lawyers on my contract. Yeah. I'm like, he would never do that. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So what year did you buy the, the insurance brokerage? This was 2008. Okay. So, so 2008, and then w w two questions. Was it, um, how long, when did it finally get over? And when did you finally start pulling yourself out of it? And the second question is, was the business fail? Did the business fail because of uncertain economic times in the, the great recession? Or did it fail because of you? Or, and, no, and it failed because of me. 
Gotcha. I wish I wish I could church this up here and say that it, it, <laughs> yeah. I, I signed a really bad contract. It was it was the coronavirus, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah so. it was the coronavirus in 2008. <laughs> yeah, took it out. yeah uh, Corona. It was Trump. It was Trump's fault. It was Trump's Trump, Trump, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we blame him for everything else. Every 40, you know, 100 years, it's all his fault anyway. So I wish it could have been 2020. I would have had so many more so excuses. Many yeah. Uh, yeah. But no, it, 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 too, it would be very simple for me to say it was bad economic times. But um, it was I signed a contract that allowed someone to take advantage of us. And um, they did. And it's not their fault. I was the idiot that signed the contract. Yeah. And I was the idiot that did the deal. So, you know, if you let people do bad, stupid things to you. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so I uh, we got out of it. It was about a year uh, later. And um i just started to rethink everything and during the time though it created this um more like this it, not scarcity mindset but it was like wow i'm really stupid like it was it was this and then it became this thing like i either have i either need to learn from this and i need to understand more of this and so i just started reading everything i could get my hands on uh, like everything i would just devour books and i just tended to fall towards investment risk and understanding what investment risk was and how it's made up and what are the things that involve risk um, because I'm so burned at this point mm -hmm. and I'm so gun shy. And then, but that stopped me from doing like anything for like a year and a half, like anything. I just, I was so scared. Um, on the, on and then, the back end of that, yeah. what, what switched on kind of the, as yeah. you climbed out of that? Yeah. Cause my, and the, kind of, just to add on me, I've been in depression. I, I struggle with, you know, where I sleep 14 hours a day and I don't get out of bed. I get out of bed to maybe like take a shower or something. And I go back to bed. Even when I'm running my real estate investment business, I would, there would be yeah. days I'd be in bed at four o'clock in the afternoon, negotiating deals or just saying, I don't want to talk to anybody right now, but I had to do something, you know, and I, I for months at a time. So how, I mean, I'm guessing it, I don't know if you were that like at that extent, but yeah. Yeah, but, it, it but was like getting yourself out of my wife's like, Hey, why don't we just go out and sit in the grass for a while? And pull me out of bed. You know? <laughs> like what, once you're in that I mindset, mean, you're in that poor me life sucks. Yep. And maybe you have some chemical yep. imbalances, but at the end of the day, it's like, I don't want to go read a effing book. I don't want to go read a book no. about like, you know, no, how to be exactly. successful. You're like, fuck this. I screwed no it reason up. To, because you can't be successful. Right. Correct. That's how I can. And I, I think, um, that I, I don't have any kind of chronic depression or anything like that. So I think I was very fortunate in that aspect to be able to pull myself out of work. That could have been a trigger for something much, much worse. Um, but when I looked at it, it was, I think, two things. And that was accepting the reality of the situation. But accepting that the situation is not me. Gotcha. And uh, that was a very different distinguishing. That it's okay to make stupid mistakes and decisions. And once again, I credit this a lot though to my family they they helped out they helped me out and uh instead of saying you you're so, horrible or anything else like that and it was like okay and then i had a fire in me that said i gotta make up for this mm -hmm. and now i gotta prove to myself and others that i'm not this failure which is what i felt mm -hmm. but I, I knew what failure was like so i had to figure out a new path forward um and that process led me to understand a lot more things about risk and where we were going but it also really installed in me that revenues from the assets that we had we didn't own those those could go away at any time because that's what had happened we bought the shop the guy that we bought it from his wife came and took all our clients hmm. that we had just paid them for millions and um because she didn't have a non-compete and so, um, yeah, I know. No, right? that's, that's yeah. Funny. And so, uh, what happened was I, I realized, okay, that right out of the situation is I can't keep blaming this person. I signed the contract. It was yeah. me. I made the mistakes. Okay. We're over that. Let's get done. You screwed up bad. I, you know, I had to get it. You know, you sound like it's like, you just make a decision. This is wallowing for a year, but, uh, you know, and then, uh, so I'm like, okay, let's, let's move forward. Let's, let's get on past this. Uh, you know, gained a lot of weight, slept a lot, uh, really good, healthy stuff. And then I said, let's understand kind of the economics of the situation, why this can go. And, and now how do I grow from here? Now, how do we expand? How do I get you? Are my goals dead? I mean, I'm like 28 or 29, right? Am I done? Um, and two, I kind of thought I was a smart guy before. And so I think all that really actually helped. It was humbles you, right? Uh, it humbled big yeah. time. And in two, it also led me to understand a few basic things. I cannot force success and I can't change 
things, right? Like I don't fight the market. I don't fight economy. And when data says something, I don't argue with it. I don't try to make up a reality in my mind. It's not like, oh, I love this investment property so much. And now I'm going to figure out a way to get it done, even though what's being told is telling me not to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't do that anymore because that's what I did. There were so many things that said you should do that. You shouldn't do this deal. And I did it because it was ego and it was pride. I can overcome all these things, right? Which yeah. is just a lie we tell to ourselves. So that understanding that and understanding that risk. And then I figured out, listen, if I know and can identify good opportunities, mitigate risk, then there's nothing that I can't do except lie to myself. So I was like, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to put myself in a position where I'm making a reality that will never um, come to grips and rest, risk mine and other people's money or entire lives. Um, I was, thought I would be the quickest millionaire on earth. And it's just millionaire and then gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was one of those things where I said, we kind of moved on and said, this model won't work. It sells. We always have to regenerate. It's non-predictable. And at the end of the day, that meant it was non-compoundable. And that was the key because I couldn't have to regenerate the original source and still be able to compound. It doesn't make sense and it doesn't work. And there was other things that went against us. Like uh, there was everything from taxes to where if I'm investing a dollar, you know, people are like, oh, I get a 20% return. But if you're investing in after-tax dollars, you're not getting a 20% return, yeah. right? You're not getting a 20% return at all because you already lost 50%. So it became this hyper-realistic viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to make stuff up like, oh, no, I, I have my after tax dollars and that's what I invest in. That's my return. I'm like, no, I, I lost that money. How? So let's really dig down and look into numbers. And two, I was very open with people after that point. I'm like, how could this fail? Yeah. And I get a lot of smart people together and say, how's this going to fail? Show me how it's going to fail. Yeah. Because I know I'm not seeing it. I know there's something here. It doesn't mean I'm going to accept it. But I need to know and I need to understand the odds and then I need to mitigate those risks and then determine whether this will be a successful venture or not and whether this will move us forward and something that will be lasting forever. Nothing is short term. I'm not going to do anything that's short term. Yeah. And with those things, it leads to certain types of assets and asset classes, right? Um, but for me, I just there was this vulnerability of that revel, revenue and in my income because I thought I was going broke that would just disappear, right? My revenue, my income would just go away because I was a sales guy. Um, and that just installed this, we need to get residual income coming in, but I didn't like real estate. And so when I looked at it, I liked some properties of it, but investing and getting those kind of returns that was foreign to me when we were out buying companies and getting, you know, we were paying three times revenue with a 50% margin. Um, those numbers to me, I, when looking at, you know, multifamily and stuff, it was confusing. Cause I'm like, why do, why do people do this? Um, I just didn't get it. And, uh, but storage merged my, what I liked and what I thought I was good at with all the great things about aspect that I liked, I could come in, I could do things to try to improve the asset. So that made me say, there's things that I can do to control the situation, which was important to me. I'm not leaving it up. And that became the defining factor in my underwriting. So when we underwrote, I don't underwrite for the future. I don't yeah. make up numbers. Mm -hmm. Like I don't believe in an IRR where we're, oh, we get a 20% annual IRR because in five years yeah. we sell it for this huge number. Yeah. And I'm um, like, well, so you just made up the sell. Let me ask you this. Cause so we're buying an eight unit. We, we've gone kind of crazy on, on multifamily, like on just rentals. Cause I'm worried about inflation. Um, mm -hmm. And so we bought a 24 unit with three other partners in tri cities. And then we bought um, a couple of duplexes and I'm under contract right now on an eight unit at a million 33. And it's like a good like gentrification play, I think. Uh, it's it cash flows that you know we have a you know on our somebody one of our partners is going to manage it. it. Cash flows with property management, capex, all that stuff. But it's not like a great cash like it's not like a home run cash flow deal. But I feel like this is a great area. Of, I own a duplex right there. I want to own in this area. They just put a Starbucks there. So like, and I have investors. You know, I have my I have my cousin in there who he's a yeah. firefighter. Um, and he, he had refied some cash out cause he had owned a rental and he wanted to do some more rental. So I'm, he's trusting me. Um, my, yeah. one of my private lenders is trusting me. And it's like, man, I've looked over this. I, you know, I've gone over it with Jay Scott and it's just like, so, so, so hard because you want to get, there's hard to find yield right now. Right. And there's hard to find a shelters for two twenty twenty cash dollars. And so do you ever take any of that into consideration? I don't, I'm Absolutely. not giving IR, IRR projections like that. I can't project what five-year appreciation is going to be. I can't. Does it work yeah. today? 
yeah, hopefully the rents increase at the trend, hopefully the property appreciates, but does it work today? Does everything cover our debt service and our more? And so like, but it's still hard because I'm in the off market world where I'm looking at sexy, sexy deals for the last five years that are like huge. Yeah, I'm 60%, 50% equity. This one, I'm maybe, you know, after, you know, our, we're buying 30 down, 30% down, basically 25, 30% down. And we probably have like a 10% equity buffer in there. And so it's basically a kind of a retail, maybe a little bit below, but. Well, first of all, you guys got to understand something that is clearly my, I, I learned very early and throughout this whole thing, I realized something that was critical to, I think the development in our investing strategy was that we were rich, but we were not wealthy. Okay. And those are two very different things because mm -hmm. anyone that earns a high salary is rich. Yeah. They have lots of income coming in, right? But if you're rich, you can lose that income at any moment. Mm -hmm. right? If you're a surgeon and you shatter your hands, you are not rich anymore. No, it's over. Yeah. Right. Well, and NFL players a... happen all the time. Look at the NFL or NBA, right? Yeah, exactly. So rich means you make a lot of money. Being wealthy means you don't have to make money. And that stood out very much when I understood that concept that I'm like, I'm not financially free. Mm -hmm. I'm not wealthy. I have to get out there every day and I have to try to earn that commission. I'm a high paid employee from these companies that pay me and they fire me, right? They fire me and leave and go hire somebody else. So I always have to go get another job. It's like this constant treadmill I was on. Um, and when I realized that I thought, man, this is not the right path and not doing the right thing. So there were aspects to real estate besides just the overall return. Like you're talking about that you have to take in consideration. I weight those in kind of income differently because if you look at your income now that you have, that's a dollar. Well, first of all, if you're taxed 50% on it and how much time did it take to make that dollar versus a, a dollar from real estate, how much time does it take to make that dollar and how much are you taxed on it? Yep. That changes how that dollar, what, what the actuality of that dollar is into your pocket. Correct. It's not the same. Correct. Right. So there's, there's um, wealth generating activities and then there's wealth preservation and becoming wealth, right? And so I, I I was okay discounting those dollars to a certain extent because it's not really discounting. It's yeah. no, I get way more of this, right? And I figured out early on is I could make half as much income from this business as that business and I would yeah. make more. It's I'd like still flipping like, or like you're wholesaling coal, right? Like, well, yeah, I was, I was gonna bring up the example of AJ when AJ called me in, uh, I think it was May. He was like, dude, I wanna start, um, it's like I want to, I want to, he was trying to, I, mean, I think you were, you're starting to get into expanding yourself storage side even more. You're going to, you wanted to bring on investors and the whole, the whole deal there. They're like, do I need to start marketing for these? I'm like, why don't you throw in a, uh, a, uh, single family side too? And you're like, yeah, why not? Why not? I haven't even thought about that. So I know you guys got it rolling now, but, um, what is the goal with that side of, of your business now? The, um, with, even with a single yeah. family, I know you're trying to, to scale yeah. the, um, with other people's money, scale the self storage stuff, but how do you see those tying together? Well, and that's a great question because I understand when you're looking at compounding your returns, I understand there's different type of income generations. I have two, you have earned, right? You have basically, we'll call it passive just for, you know, simplicity stake, but then you have scalable income. Okay. There's different models where income can scale itself without, with, without being bound upon its limits in the business. Right. Um, and think of those things as like online businesses or things like that. The, the, the network effect allows that um, value to spread in the market with very little effort. Real estate is not one of those things. Right. If I have 800 units, that is maxed out to filling up those 800 units and how much I can generate or how much I can uh, uh, get from those 800 units. The storage facility doesn't automatically make 800 more units. I have to go buy another one. So my capital has to be redeployed. So for me to get where I wanted and my goals, I said, I need to have all three. I, I wanted to have this earned capacity side, which is my time is valuable. So when I'm spending my time on any of my activities, I should be earning something from it. I need my business income, right? These scalable types of income that are coming to generate. They have much higher odds of being way bigger. Which would be um, like uh, insurance uh, sales, uh, like a car sales business or a call, a car, or call center, uh, real estate, wholesaling, buying, you know, things like that is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. So like that's if regenerating. I have you have to go out and get new income, but it's a building a process and a team. 
Is and that- once you have the foundation, you can scale it. We have online businesses, right? Product places. We have software companies. So I own a software company and on uh, multiple online businesses, um, different things like that, which there's theoretically no limits, okay. right? Um, so I can just keep expanding and add units of production, but the, the company doesn't need any more. Um, the infrastructure set. And, and even when I look at this wholesaling thing, and, and that's once again, how I evaluate risk. I go, okay, let's look at the bounds, how much the market is, what is needed. And I, I guess I've done this a lot to where it just clicks. So when I was talking with Cole, I was like, okay, there's a need for this market. It's not there. And, and I always look at things, if we can be the biggest and the best, yeah. like immediately, I'm pretty competitive. So I'm like, can I dominate this market? When you talk to me, you're like, uh you're like what do i need and i was like you need this i said you're like what uh, what if i want to be the biggest wholesale company in idaho then what do i need <laughs> and it was just immediately uh you, you didn't understand anything about the business at the time but right away you nothing went, yeah you're like if i'm gonna do this i'm not gonna, I'm gonna do- yeah, yeah if i'm gonna do it i'm gonna be the biggest yeah. and uh if not there's no reason to do it so <laughs> i was like you know and i and then too i i go and i work with people that are the experts like cole and that's always been key. Whoa, and whoa, I, whoa. You're throwing expert around pretty <laughs> liberally there. Come on. He's 22. I don't even think he's shaved yet. I mean, have you even kissed a girl yet, Cole? I mean, come on. I mean, I shaved her from time yesterday. Yeah, I mean, come on. So, you know, let's, just, let's put that in context. I mean, I know he's smart and all, but in, in comparison to me, <laughs> uh, what he's done, he's by far far the expert. Um, I'm just kidding. And, Cole's fantastic. I'm just yeah, kidding. Well, and two in this marketplace, there's nobody that was doing anything like what Cole's doing. No. Nobody had, there's nobody in our area or marketplace. And I knew that that knowledge and that framework, if applied, the, the, right, the economics doesn't change. The need didn't change versus our market to his. So he had it. He, Cole nailed it. He was doing something right. And I go, okay, that's perfect. If I can have you help me mimic that. I don't need to know it all. Right. Mm -hmm. And if I need to know it all, I shouldn't be getting into that business. Literally. I'm I'm like, Nope. Oh no. I need somebody that's way smarter than me that can help me guide me. I need mentors. I need good employees because if you're going to make it big and if you're going to accomplish really big things in life, you need a lot. You need a lot of resources, knowledge, expertise, and the network effect is extremely important to derive big success. And so when we looked at this and after talking to Cole, I said, the situation is right. I think the market's right. The timing's right. Nobody else is doing this. And I'm in a position to where we can figure it out, which we're still trying to figure this out, right? We're not making money. I'm losing money. That's fine. I I, I get that. I don't expect businesses to be magically profitable. I do expect there to be incremental progress and that we should have targets that we generate. And I should see that progress moving along. And two, I have no problem if I fell. Yeah. Like if I fell, that's that's I'll come back and tell you why I felled. And so it looks like you've bother. been you've been using at least our, our center for almost two months now. Why don't you talk a little bit? Because I think there's a lot of people maybe on a smaller scale. And and if anybody doesn't know, Boise is probably a lot of people are moving to Boise from California to get out of these the certain kind of states. I was in Boise a couple of weeks ago. The crane, I couldn't believe the downtown, how much it's it grown. Crazy. And so Boise's really a secondary market that's turning into a first market that's yep. freaking quickly. competitive really quickly, really quickly. quickly. i mean really but quickly st- we, stay we're, away. We're right behind yeah stay away yeah Stop coming. But, yeah uh, yeah to give you any idea um in 2018 we had something like six thousand homes on the market right in this month right now we have 500 and we have the amount of people moving here that we can't even house them it, yeah. it doesn't even work um, yeah. because we have way more than that a month moving here. And you guys don't um, have a multifamily out there, right? Like you see. No, you know, no, no, no. We were so low on multifamily. Before the recession, we had less than 10% of all housing was multifamily. The average do, metropolitan area is over 30%. Do they not have like zoning for multifamily? What's the dirt zoning like? Can you build Nobody multifamily? did it because it was just not, it didn't yield enough. Oh, uh, because there's. And houses and were too cheap, spread out, right? It's like. Cheap. It's like yeah. tri cities where there's you're not landlocked, so they keep going out farther, and then then they yeah, run into the south. In, they're it's in, now starting they're, to get landlocked. They're in, they're, so, but they're infill stuff. They they say, oh, yeah. screw, we don't need to do infill. We'll just keep building out. And now all of a sudden, they're like, shit, we need to build infill because we're getting yes. out of space, and we can't too far away. Yeah, our capacity can't handle it. All that stuff. So, yep. 
So Bingo. do they have multifamily dirt zoning over there though? They're building multifamily like crazy here. I mean, yeah. there's apartment buildings and massive ones coming up everywhere. Uh, and, and even then it, people still can't find good options. It, it's just, they, they fill up before they're even built. It's, oh. it's oh. crazy. So where I was going with this is I wanted to preface because everybody's like, oh, their market's easier. Their thing's di different. Cole runs oh, a no. business in Seattle which is one of the most competitive markets. Tucker runs a business in Portland, Lake Oswego, which is one of the most competitive. And Boise is probably one of the top, I would say seven or eight competitive markets right now in the nation. Yeah. Um, I mean, our, our housing prices grew at like 30% in two years. I mean, it's, crazy. it's stupid. So then, then what I want to do is kind of, why don't you talk about, okay, you started with Cole, you hired Cole, what Cole do for you? What has he been doing for you? What kind of traction are you seeing? What are you doing next? What do you need to build? What, what's your plan? How, if you're building this, you, you're basically, we're telling people, how does a business owner build a wholesaling business from, from scratch? And yeah. tell us like how you're doing it and, and okay, talk so about the struggles. All, yeah, first of all, I think how you build a wholesaling business from scratch, coming from the person that's not successful at building a wholesale business from scratch is really easy. You just put a lot of money into it and it, it doesn't <laughs> You pay uh, Elliot and Cole but, for our <laughs> non-shaved expertise, you know. No, uh, I think, first of all, it's the principles of building a business, though, are always the same. They just never, they just don't. You need to have special, uh, you need to have processes and systems that are set in place to derive the result that you want. That result needs to be profitable enough for that capital to be out reallocated back into the business and keep generating the same result. And this is the fundamental. So it, it's having a system to execute and get a known rate of return. So I need a known rate on this action, on this cost, and on this time. And if I have a known rate based upon those things, then I can repeat it. Mm -hmm. Then it's how fast you can repeat it and how fast you can expand it. So when what, what Cole did an incredible job with was he had developed amazing processes and systems. And that's how come I knew, okay, that can be repeatable, right? I'm like, I can redo that. Why? Because it's not dependent once again on me. It's not like Cole can't, Cole's the best wholesaler in the world and he's just out killing it. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be as good as him. No, Cole built a good business. Those are very different things. And so if you take those processes and systems and then based upon the result, we can see where I'm failing. So I can say, we're not achieving these metrics. What do we need to change? And what's working, what's not working? So Cole's system had ways for us to measure it. We could actually look, here's our pipeline. Here's leads coming in. Here's the good leads that we have. Here's the leads in the hopper. Here's the leads that are closing. When we started out, one thing I think we underestimated was we needed more volume. And we also too, my people needed to be trained. So after the first month, it was kind of going slow. We weren't really getting anything or doing anything. But we realized, okay, we needed to change some things in the system. And that was event, uh, that was really just opening up the nozzle at the top, Yeah. right? Yeah, I yeah. needed to be able to fail more. Yeah. I needed my people to be able to fail. And, so, Brian, and Brian flew up for, for a little while. Yes. About, yeah. Cool. Yep. Talk, Brian talk, came add up on to that on call, you, you talk about oh. with our calls, like direct mail, like the difference between the direct mail failing and the cold calling and text messaging failing. Like we've talked about this before. Yeah, I mean, I think before that, AJ is hitting on some huge points right now with you don't have to know everything when you're getting in. Like so many people don't get into real estate because they think they need to know every little single thing. Like for me, I'm where I'm at because like on the real estate business side, I hired a guy that's incredible at sales and he can train salespeople and manage salespeople. When I needed to learn systems, I paid people money to go learn how to put together systems. Like with a call center, I'm not really like a natural born CEO. We went and found a guy that Tucker, who gave us a yes. podcast, he's a CEO. I'm not a sales guy again. Elliot's a sales guy for the, for the call center. So um, that's, that's a huge point. But yeah, getting back to um, the point, uh, what AJ's making is so many people, if you can't track something, you don't have systems in place, you don't know what's going wrong and know why you're not doing well. He, he could see clearly, okay, we need more leads. Our guys can be able to fail more, which most people are not going to say, we need more opportunities to fail. They're going to say, they're going to cry about what they have right now not being enough. He's or saying, this isn't working, so we just need to stop. Exactly. You're like, no, we need, more, we need more of that same thing. So the systems can get better. Our people can get better. Um, and I mean, I think that's, that's not something to skip over. Is, well, and uh, it, we did the same thing like Cole's talking about. I went out and I found a guy that I just love to death, Brian, and he's, he's, he's willing. He's like, I'm going to go out. I'm going to hit it hard. Um, you know, he, he was ready to be aggressive. He's ready to hit the phone calls. Um, and it sat down and we talked about, listen, this is where it's at. This is what needs to happen. And, um, then he needed help. 
because if you hire somebody, you know, you got to help them. You got to encourage them along. And um, Brian is in a situation like, you know, I was, and a lot of people are, it was commission-based. We were going to help him make sure he could survive because like he needed to be able to last, but it being commission-based too, though, he was building a business. Yeah. So we're more like partners mm-hmm. and I needed him. I needed to be able to have the confidence, not only in him, but he needed to understand we can fail here, but we need to fail forward and it needs to be measurable. And two, we're going to try to give you the resources to make you successful and back you. So when he he went up to uh, up with Cole and your guys' team up there and he just sat and he came back and he was just like, holy cow, um, that was uh, that was a big game changer, right? It's because you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. When we got in, when I got into storage, we didn't know anything about storage. The only thing we knew about storage is that you didn't tell anybody you were in storage because it's kind of embarrassing. People are like, isn't that like a junkyard? I mean, at the time when we got into storage, it was, you know, it was now it's like an place. asset class. I am a storage unit builder and I'm an investor in storage units or mobile home. Yes. Parks. Before that it's like, like a huge thing. It was yeah. not cool yeah. uh, before 2008 at all. <laughs> in fact, most people thought it was going to go away. They thought this is a junkyard thing. That's just going to be gone. Um, and so we went out and found people and we teamed up with people and we learned how to do it. Uh, so I think if you have the ability to say we can make the right kind of mistakes, once again, this comes back down to the risk, there's fatal mistakes and there's the stupid mistakes like I made, right? Mm. But then there's mistakes and there's risks that are not only not fatal, they are necessary. And I'll take those on all day long. Mm -hmm. And two, it has to deal with my core competencies. So I know what I'm trying to achieve. I know what I'm, where I'm going and I know what I'm good at. And then I have to patch things in around to fill the rest out because I can't be good at everything. I don't want to be good at everything. And I need that team. I need that education. I need that knowledge in place to create processes and systems that can execute and create a result over and over and over again that we want. And that's a business. That's the difference between a business, a job or an income or a side gig or anything else like that, right? If you have to be at work to make money, it's not a business, right? You're earning a salary. Even right. if you were, even if your own boss. I think like the last the sorry, summary of the business, like you were talking about more opportunities to fail, like the slogan for starting a business and any business is more opportunities to fail. Because the more opportunities yep. to fail, the more opportunities you have to make money. Like with, like mm-hmm. if you're if you're flipping real estate, if you're wholesaling, every time you put yourself out there and you try to scale anything, you're, you're naturally what you're doing is finding more opportunities to fail. Well, in speed. So I, I, I do a thing where I really focus on feedback loops. Feedback loops are very important and you need to be able to look at what's happening. You need to be able to determine whether it's working or not. And you need to be able to close that feedback loop to progress on and to do it right and to build it correctly. And so when we first got started, that was the first thing that appeared to me after the first month. It was like, we do not have enough data. We do not have enough information to to close out these feedback loops because there's not enough opportunities. So it was like, just bombard us. Like, we're like, we just need leads. We need opportunities. I mean, because I wanted more chances to fail and more feedback loops to start solving problems to build because I need to cut that time out, right? and, And that's really capital at the end of the day is just a substitute for time. So I was in a position where I could pay to get a lot more and that will speed up our success because I can just fail a lot more quickly and we can, we can figure it out. We can make, uh, make it work, readjust, and then do it over again. All right, podcast listeners. I want to take a quick break and I want to tell you about something I'm very passionate about. And that is our deal finders Academy or the DFA, as many of you have probably heard me refer to it as. Now, the DFA has been around for almost seven years, which is amazing that we've had it around that long, and we've had one hell of a track record with some of the biggest names from across this business having been a part of the DFA or are still a part of it today. And some of those names, just to drop a few on you, are Justin Silverio from Open Letter Marketing, Ryan Dossie from Call Porter, Jason Nickel from a little company called Lead Sherpa, Anson Young from Bigger Pockets, of course, many of you know him. Uh, how about Robert Hyder and Philip Vincent, two fine gentlemen from the greater St. Louis area who need no introduction, are very well known. Uh, how about Mr. Danny O'Bannon, the original Spokane Project, a uh, guy that I pulled back out of a day job and turned him into a crazy successful real estate investor. And of course, Artem Tepler, who's building hundreds of millions of dollars worth of multifamily all over the greater Los Angeles area. And 
of course, last but not least, uh, both Cole and Elliot, who are now the hosts of this show. So as you can see, the list goes on and on. And there's so many other people that I didn't mention there that uh, I've gotten the, the good fortune of getting to know and that are a part of the community now that are just amazing people and uh, even more av- amazing investors. But for you that are a listener of the show that may be thinking, hey, you know what? I might be interested in joining that group. Here's what you get, right? Well, number one is you get to be a part of this amazing community. You get the connections. You get everything that comes along with a small and very tight-knit type mastermind, a group that isn't so big that you feel like you can't converse with people, you can't have conversations, um, because that's where you kind of get lost in the weeds. You want one that is just big enough that it's got reach, and you've got these people that you can connect with that are amazing in their own right, but not so big that you just feel overwhelmed, and that is exactly what the DFA is. We have about 120, 125 people in the group, which is just the perfect size, and the reason why it stays at that size is because we don't overlap investors, right? one investor per one area. And that's why most people stay with us for a very long time because by being a part of the group, you get access to all of our secret marketing strategies, negotiation strategies, tips, tricks, everything else you could possibly think of so that you can have those competitive advantages in your area and also be able to utilize the network that the DFA is, which as you can tell, it's an amazing network. I do business with lots of people that have been in it or are currently in it right now. And uh, plenty of other people in the group have made lifelong friendships and business partnerships within the group also. So if you're interested in joining the DFA, which I strongly encourage you to do, go to thedealfindersacademy.com, book a call, you'll chat with Dan, we'll see if we've got room in your market for you. And uh, if we do, we'd love to make you our next DFA member. I love the point you said about building a business because we started doing real estate um, back full-time in like 2015, but like we were, I was working part-time. I was, you know, my wife and I are both working part-time. We were traveling. I was golfing 130 rounds a year, but we were still clipping a good, you know, mid six figure business, like making money, buying a couple of rentals here and there. But I had to perform. I still had some guys on my team, but I still had to do stuff. Like it wasn't, a, it was a high paid job. Like if I just stopped, it stopped coming in. So we really shifted this year is like, we're really, now we're really bankable. So we we're adding more rentals. But then also the thing I love about like, not even to pitch it, but more so the call center I'm building with Cole is it's scalable and it's, it's sellable, right? That's the thing that I really like about it. And it will work without me. And yes. so that's the thing is wholesaling technically isn't a, you can't scale and sell me. You can't sell my business nope. of wholesaling nope. because the, the business is me and my wife and a couple people, but you can't sell our systems. Like or you can't sell our systems. You can't sell coal, right? It's not worth um, anything. Yeah. But you can buy his systems. And you can buy exactly. the processes. And so that's what we always focus on. My wife is really good at systems and processes as well. But yeah, well, it's- and, uh, and Even people that talk about like, you know, your personal brand and how there's value and things like that, which is really important. You need to build that stuff up and intellectual property, but it should be a means to create a business. Yeah. And that should not be directly tied with you because yeah. that's what I did. I went down in Florida, right? And I bought a business that was tied so close to the owner that they could screw us. Well, that business is worth nothing now, obviously we sold it, um, but it was never even worth that much anyways. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't even, when we were buying it, we weren't going to pay top dollar. And that was the problem. That's the fundamental problem that I even had with my sales business. At the end of the day, this can never scale and it can also never be sold because it can only be sold if I'm going to work. So that means there's, there's this little, you know, this back end tag where it's like, you can sell it but you have to sell it and you have to sell it with a job where you're basically chained to it. Yep, I see because business all the time. The this, oh, CEO or the owner will stay on for X amount of years to help with the transition. Yes. And, all, and it's just like, no, if I want to, no, I don't want to do that. Like, why do I need to do that? If I want to sell it, I mean, yeah. freaking McDonald's, they don't need to sell it. It's sell freaking McDonald's franchise. Right. And that's risk yeah. because people are the riskiest assets Yeah. because you, they, they, they do whatever they want, right? <laughs> yeah. They just go and they do and they do stupid, stupid things. And there's no feedback loops. There's no processes. There's no systems. It's not scalable. And I was in a people business, which I still am. I own a brokerage firm today, right? There's good things about those business, but to the reality of the situation is um, it's extremely dangerous and uh, it's not something that people want to buy, right? Mm-hmm. It is just not. There's reasons why code and technology is so valuable because the code doesn't care about anything and it spits out results constantly and it could be changed without any repercussions, right? When Facebook bought Instagram, nothing about it changed until they started to change things, 
but there's nothing to change. The code will do what the code will do. That is extraordinarily valuable. So the risk and how that the risk is uh, centered around the revenue generating portions of the business. And if that revenue ge generating portions of the business is a person, the risk becomes very, very high. Gotcha. So, okay. So why wholesaling then? Why do you want to, why do you want to get into that? You did, now you said you had a brokerage. Is that a uh, insurance brokerage or a real estate brokerage? Insurance brokerage. Okay. So and then the wholesaling actually is very simple. So my, my business is we, I love storage. We do all things storage. We find undervalued properties. We turn them around. Um, we identify the money that's sitting there. Um, it's been a very profitable model and one that we're expanding rapidly. So I started up a, a, a more of a private equity side that was not just me and my partner, um, which was just me and my dad and my brother-in-law, which had built our whole business over the last 10, 15 years, right? Um, and I started private equity side where we take on capital and we we're gonna expand, do more. We're, we have conversions, we're, we have uh, two conversions right now, Sears and a Kmart, oh, three, and an office building that I bought. Um, then we're doing ground up development. Um, Aren't you right the largest now. owner of self-storage in the United States? Not the largest, but we're in the top percentage. Um, and uh, so when you look at the projects though, and, and that's changing rapidly because self-storage is consolidating. So um, it's tr consolidating quickly. From mom, before, uh, from mom and pop single owners mom to, and pops. to more yes. uh, conglomerates like you. Yeah. And, and the landscape of still storage is why I bought into it. Because I said, when I looked at industries like, you know, we, me and Cole were talking about before, I'm like, how do I compete? Because every game is a, is a pretty, markets are made up of people and I got to compete. I got it. Why would people want to invest with me? Why am I going to get a better deal? Right? How am I going to have an edge? And when I looked at storage at the time when we started, it was like 85% of the entire industry was owned by mom and pops, one single operators, 85%. I mean, if you look at all the other asset classes, it's inverse. 80% of their markets are owned by institutions. They're funded. They're, cra you know, things that I didn't have. I couldn't compete in that. I didn't know what to, I couldn't go start competing with apartment developers, right? Or, I guess I could. I didn't know I, how, right? I thought I the, I, I, no, the I went to this uh, IMN conference last year where America's Homes for Rent was talking. All these guys are getting into the build, the, the rentals, you know, rent, you know, all that stuff. They were saying still, like, there's still a huge percentage that of, like rentals, single family housing that's still mom and pop. But single family but, is. But it's not, but it's you buy one single family, it's one single family. You buy storage, yes. it's scalable. Same with mobile home. Yes. I think Brandon was saying mobile home parks were one off owners yes. and they're they're trying to do the same mobile thing. With mobile home parks and self-storage are the same thing. So mobile home parks, so I'm talking on the commercial side. Single family home rentals is still predominantly dominated by mom and pops. Um, but when you're looking at the commercial side for apartments, retail, right? Um, mobile homes and storage were very, very, very similar, right? Banks didn't really like them before 2008. Um, well, banks still aren't fond of mobile home parks. They're harder to finance, but um, uh, it's that creates an advantage, right? Because it's all mom and pop. And so, yeah, like Brandon Turner went the same way that we did. He said, listen, this is a market where there's less competitive. People don't want to be in it for whatever reasons, right? Doesn't matter. Um, there's more inventory to buy. So that means I can grow faster and there aren't really big dominating individuals or players that I have to compete with that would make it really hard for me to make it in the market. That was my our underlying investing philosophy that if the market was good, it will consolidate over the next 25, 30 years um, and it'll match the other ones and that these aren't real estate assets, they're businesses. So we're going to go buy investment properties and turn them into businesses and the upside is going to be massive. Mm -hmm. That's it. We didn't know anything about the storage side. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm like, I can figure that all out. We can screw up and figure out which we did. Uh, but it was the, the thesis was correct. Um, it was a way to mitigate risk and it was a way to use these uh, levers to drive revenue, increase value and redeploy that capital in a market that allowed us to expand it. And so the, in mobile home parks is, is the same. But when you look at all these other ones from apartments to uh, hotels to right, this is this, these are institutional players. Yeah, so own, yeah the retirement time. funds that people are placing, hedge yeah. funds that are placing money, you know, yep. hey, you're going to get, a, uh, here's your IRR, here's your yield, you know, for the hedge funds and, you know, and all this stuff. And yeah. that's, yeah. They don't now expect are, huge returns, which no, I, I just want a consistent I, I want a return. return. Yeah. yeah, some safe, consistent return, you know, where we're not going to lose people's pension money, even though it seems Bingo. like they're all going broke. And so, 
<laughs> when we were, yeah, no kidding, right? But uh, the, the, when we were building out our storage side and everything, and we wanted to expand it, I said, okay, now in order to expand and really scale our business, we need two things. I need inventory and I need money. At first I said, I'm just going to go to other people to get my inventory and get my money. So capital aggregators, right? People that place funds. Um, and I quickly learned if I want to get as big as I want to, if I want to dominate in the space and I want to get my results that I want to, I need to control my future. Remember, I'm kind of nuts about that whole losing control over your future thing because I did it and I got bad, right? Yeah. So I thought if somebody else is controlling my money, the moment they say, oh, geez, AJ, we didn't know you had a red beard. This is over. We just can't stand people with red beards. It's those and Irish guys, you know, it's anybody, exactly. you know, with a red beard, you know, it's just, Craig, you can't really, trust them. Their credit risk is really, really high. Really, really high. <laughs> I mean, right? I if I see those farm guys. guys. Right? Yeah. I, I have no control over that. And all, and I didn't want one person to have control over my future. Just like I didn't want, just like I shouldn't have had one person control over my future when I bought that business back again. So I said, I got to bring this inside. I need to be the one because I'm operating the business. People need to invest with me. They need to understand what I'm doing. Not some guy that gets money and then gives it to other people. The second side was, if I don't have predictable, dependable product inventory to buy, I don't really have a business. Mm -hmm. And so then we said, we need to internalize the process and method to find and get deals. So I immediately said, okay, we're going to start looking at conversions developments. And, and we knew exactly what we were doing there and building out. And I'm lying in bed one night and I'm thinking, I have no idea how to build out uh, large systems to find off market deals right? Um, Cause I don't buy deals on market. Um, and I'm thinking, Oh, I'm going to hire somebody and they'll just make calls. Or anything. I don't really know how to do this. And I go, oh, but I know who does. So literally the next morning I reached out to Cole and said, Hey, what if I paid you to just go find me storage deals, right? Just, yeah. I'll just pay you money. You just, you just go do it, Cole. And he was like, well, we don't really do this in storage, but he's like, you know, AJ, you really probably should build a business out of this. Why don't we teach you how to do the single family homes? And that will fuel and create reoccurring revenue because the long end tell of larger assets, right? For sales guys, that's long, yeah. right? Yeah. They, they may find a deal, but it may not be for months. Yeah. And so then I'm like, I don't know how to keep these sales guys. And Cole's like, what we need to do is we need to build a business around your need which that has always made me successful is building businesses around the needs, right? It wasn't something that I'm like, oh, I just, you know, I really want to be a tech superstar. So I'm going to go start up a tech company. I didn't know anything about it, nothing to do with. There was a need. I could identify the need and I had, some, and I could figure out a way to solve that need. And it was my need. So we put that together where we said this company could sustain, right? And build out and then keep my inventory for storage going. So the sales guys. So you, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're yeah, going. Go you're talking about the the wholesale model and learning the that, wholesale. and that out. But then, so like we're calling for some guys that are looking for um, convenience stores, and it's actually worked pretty good. They got some leads and stuff. So like, are you yeah. trying to like what you're trying to say now is you're laying the groundwork for building systems for an off market system. Where you're like, if I make money in Boise, that's great. If I make money there, but I really want to find an and build an off-market system and how to generate leads for self-storage. Is that yes, kind of much your bigger assets? Oh, yeah. So, so when I went, when I came to him, like, yeah, we can absolutely do this. Like, like you're saying, it's working. I'm like, we can hammer the, we can, we can, we can get lead flow for this off-market stuff. And I was like, AJ, do you want to be the one on the phones all day talking to people? He's like, no. I'm like, you need a sales team, and you need a sales team. You need predict predictable revenue for those guys to pay their bills. So that's when the single-family side came in. Gotcha. Uh, is when we both, I kind of, I kind of had a realization like we can make it work, but you're not going to feed a sales team with just self storage stuff because there's not enough of it, and it's a longer yep. sales cycle. Exactly, yeah. and it was Genius, identifying what wouldn't work, right? And, it, and he was exactly right. Was like I, I, I couldn't solve that, and so then we said, well, if we're going to do this and build this business model out, we have to do it right, right? And two, it needs to be biggest so then we went down and we said okay this because is gonna i work. don't do anything half ass. i just gotta be the best the biggest with right. the greatest beard in the whole world and, and listen there's a reason Maybe why brandon that. turner i mean i don't want to like get in a fight between i'm buddies with brandon turner yeah, too, so beardy brandon he you know, i'm not judging you know they both are beautiful but and this is why let me give you a kind of a preference on why what you do so um i i i became paralyzed um overnight right and i i had to go to the hospital and uh, I was on life support for months. And then I've been over the last few years recovering. I was actually, they were working on my legs this morning in the hospital. Um, and so when I got out, um, I'd lost my job. My boss was kind enough to uh, 
visit me in the hospital and let me know that my sales job was over. Why you were paralyzed? Uh, yeah, while well, I was lying in a hospital bed. How, and, how, old, um, how old were you when this happened? And what? And how I did was you get thirty. Um, at 34, 33. So did you, you, cause you lost your, that business. 30, I was 33. At, at yeah, 28. Was right so you ended up going into another job. You didn't go straight back into being an entrepreneur. Yeah, so we, well, we sold our, we sold, we sold our brokerage firm, right. Uh, to a comp, a national company. Um, and I worked and ran the office. So yeah, I was good. running their divisions out West and it paid very well. And it was great. And I was good at what I did. And I was like, I'll just invest in, in storage and we'll grow that, but I'll have a high paying job. Um, and then I uh, became paralyzed from something called Guillain-Barre, um, which stopped my brain's ability from communicating with the rest of my body. My white blood cells destroyed my nervous system. And so I lost my ability to breathe within days. I just all of a sudden couldn't walk and then um, was put onto tubes. And so I, I was on life support. And then after I got out of life support, um, uh, I was in the hospital for three, four months. And then, uh, uh, but yeah, so uh, uh, my boss, who I, I, I like. I'm not saying anything bad about it. boss. Of course, I was paralyzed in the hospital. What was I supposed to, there was nothing that it's, I'm not at all saying anything bad about them, but it, it does kind of rock your world when they show up and it's like, Hey, I, sorry about everything that happened. By the way, as we all know, this, this career has ended. Um, <laughs> so you so, not only basically died in business and basically died. We're on life support, like on your deathbed with a business that you failed. But then you were also a couple of years later, let's be on physical life support in the hospital, almost dying and losing your life. So holy, holy thanks, moly. Thanks for pointing that out. This is a great interview, guys. I mean, this is <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just, well, because it, I think it really speaks to the testament is like, what I'm affirm. you're a real person. Everybody looks at, like I heard about AJ Osborne or all these guys and you're fictional, right? You're like, they're so great. They're not, people don't understand that you're a real person. And it's like, man, you're a smart guy, but you worked your ass off to get here. And it's like, and it, you've taken two major hits that most people won't have to deal with in their entire life. And you've done it in, the, in a six year span and still look at where you are. And I think it's your inspirational is what I think it is. Um, Thank you. So, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I, when I came out, I was like, I'm never doing insurance again. And um, well, I, at the time we weren't doing anything again. I was at home in bed and I was just lying there. And it was like, okay, hopefully we'll walk again. That was really the goal. Um, and so I went through life and was doing therapy and trying to learn how to get back and walk. And um, it gave me a lot of time to obviously think. Um, and so I realized though, I basically almost died in my early thirties um, and time is very limited. And so I said, if I'm going to do anything at this point, I've got to make a decision what the rest of my life is going to look like. And I, I thought that's not nearly as important as understanding how I'm going to approach it. So what it is, is really not that important, but what I do with it is. And so for me, it's not, not to be obnoxious or anything else like that, but I just decided if it's worth my time, then I just better kill it. And yeah. if not, then I shouldn't do it at all. Um, because I don't have that much time and I almost lost all my time. And so that was just kind of the approach I took after that. I'm like a normal job will never be good enough anymore. And if I'm going to do something, whether I make money, whether I do anything, it's, I just got to make sure that I put a hundred percent into it and live it up as best as I can. And so, you know, when Cole, when we talked and Cole said, Hey, this is what we're doing. I said, all right, we're doing it. Let's go. And, um, then we started on that journey and that fulfilled that end part of our private equity side that we were doing to build out all these projects and to, to really expand this. And we expanded our team and we hired, uh, you know, we hired Brian, but we hired investment management people. And we've really been in expansion mode over the last two years. Um, and it's, you know, we, we're, we're killing it on deals and everything. It's, it's been very, very good. And we've been able to do that and not, um, take away any of the things like uh, incur more risk. Um, in fact, we've uh, found lots of great ways to uh, offload risk um, or to get rid of our standards. Um, I have very high investment standards and a lot of people tell me they're unreasonable um, and that you just can't expect to get deals like that or do deals like that, but we do. And that's just something I don't want to sacrifice even if times are hard. So instead of sacrificing and doing lesser deals, I said, let's put a lot more time, effort, and money into finding the quality that we want. And uh, Cole's been helping us out on that side with that. Nice. Do you have family? Are you wife, kids? I have four kids. Oh man. Yep. Uh, yeah. We had our, we had our fourth kid when, uh, 
three months before I became paralyzed. Jeez, Louise. How, what, how old is the oldest? 12 now. Okay. Yeah, man. I just couldn't imagine having four kids. So now I always like to talk to guys because in my mind, it's, um, it's great that, you know, the business side is great, right? Everything you've done and talked about is great. Can you speak just for a minute on like, how do you find balance? And I'm always looking at, I have a one, uh, almost two year old. And so I want to, I'm struggling right now where I'm putting 60 hours a week in this call center. And it's like, I'm hanging out with them, but then I'm on my phone and I'm trying to like, trying to be cognizant. How do you, how do you be a good dad? How do you be a good husband? How do you, how do you pair that really well with like also wanting to like fill your ego and your, you're not, you're so much your ego, but you're like your desire to be really yeah. the best. Right. That's, yeah. that's a hard thing to do. And so how do you yeah. handle that? Well, it, as you can probably tell, I don't handle balance. At all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, but that's how it comes down to my kids too. I'm just, I'm obsessed with them. It's like, yeah. I'm that annoying dad. That's just like, just smothering his kid, kissing him. And like, Oh, what are we going to do? We're watching dress park. Everybody cuddle around here. Right. It's just, I, with the time that I'm with them, I, I, I just love being with them. And, and it's been really hard because of the medical complications too, because I got to spend a lot of time with them, but I was MIA, right. It was in, yeah. cause I was in a lot of pain stuff. So I couldn't do anything. Yeah. Um, and I still have to kind of balance some of that stuff out, but we just, prioritize that what I'm doing, I'm doing also for my family. And like, so we did an acquisition, right? My sec, uh, my second oldest, my boy got to go out, fly out and see my acquisition. And we traveled and did work together. And so it's not only a balance for me of spending time with them, but it's also a balance of being a good example. I come from families that we pride ourselves. It's like they brag on who right works the most, right? They're all farmers. They're like, oh, I get up at five yeah. and I work till I get, you know what I mean? But that carries on and that creates a bonding portion, which I bond with my family over work. And so for me, balance isn't really about, I don't take or trade. Yeah. It's all one. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, you know, me and my wife, we bought a school and uh, we, we bought a school, but my wife did it. She runs it and everything else like that. And she's been growing into building like high school. Is it like one of those, uh, um, cause we were looking at, cause we don't want to put our kid in public school. And I'm looking at a lot of these, uh, school alternatives, like, uh, they're actually putting them in like, uh, like you were talking about putting storage units in like the Kmart's, the abandoned Kmart's I, Idaho falls. I has, guess has two of them in like, uh, in those shopping centers or whatever, but, um, what yeah, it's a private school. So okay. it's a private school. We have, uh, she has, um, uh, preschool all the way up to middle school and they're building high school. Now they're nice. building out the buildings. We have a campus, um and everything and it was once again we I, i'm not good at being balanced so me and my wife were like we don't like public school we don't like the options we don't like what's going on so we have two things there was the school that kids were going it was either failing we said all right we either take them out and try to figure something else out or we could just do it ourselves <laughs> so instead <laughs> of homeschooling <laughs> you built a school <laughs> yeah. That's, oh man so uh, yeah so it, we get to spend our but our kids are involved in these things right? Yeah. They're going to the school. They're seeing as my wife is working with all her employees, right? They, it's, they know why it's, a, it's something that we talk about. We're extremely transparent and extremely open, right? I'm underwriting assets with my boys, right? And then we're going skiing or we're planning trips and, Hey, I got to go do this. Why don't we? So it's, we, we view our life as a family activity, everything, mm -hmm. school, business, everything is a family activity. Gotcha. That's uh, sorry. Cool. Go ahead. My only, my only tough part of me, I just have to balance time by the pool or time working inside. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's got to be just rough. Well, there's the beach. Yeah. Not yeah. Just the pool. The yeah. beach. You got to balance I, that. I really out. hate to see what happens when you actually get a girlfriend. Like, I feel sorry for any of those girls, though, because I'm like, hey, he's going on a date this Friday. I'm like, hey, Cole, are you excited about your date? He's like, that's whatever. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just like, <laughs> Bro, like you gotta get excited. Or we're playing Xbox. We play Xbox like two hours together every night. And I'm talking to him, I'm like, are you excited about this? He's like, oh, whatever. I just hope they don't blow me up and bug me during work time too much. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> now, I, I, I get that when me and my wife uh, were first, uh, were, were, were engaged and uh, get married. It was, it was very clear. Like you, we're, we're either going to be rich or broke, but either way, it's going to be all in, right? And, and my wife, uh, uh, her, her, dad was a train engineer. And so he was always gone. Right. And he was yeah. always ordering stuff like that. So it was, that worked out very well for us just from the standpoint, she's like, no, you get out there, right. Make it happen. What not? But I, I like working. So I, yeah. I feel you Cole. I know you like distractions yeah. from work. Ugh. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, I used to go to my dad. My dad's a physician and he had a clinic in Boise at one time and, but he had 60 employees. I would go to the clinic and we go skiing. He talked to me all the time about real estate. This, he, my dad's a physician and never once did he say, Elliot, you need to go to college to get a college degree. He always said, Elliot, you're great at people. It's, he would take me on adult trips where we go. Like I remember going in, you know, in Idaho, there's the salmon where they do the like four day kayak or the whitewater rafting trip. Yeah. I kayaked yeah. in whitewater. We did that for four days. I'm the only 13 year old It's all adults. And he's just like, he just treats me like one of the adults. And I think people don't understand, like they shelter their kids from real life so much, yeah. but it's just like, I, when I was, I, all my friends are probably your age, AJ or older. I mean, Cole's my youngest friend by far, but because they're so immature, but they don't know how to talk to adults. But I grew up with only adults yeah. learning how to have a conversation. When do I talk? When do I not talk? What's appropriate? What type of person? Mm -hmm. And my dad taking me into real estate deals when he was trying to, when he was an OG, he would run uh, nickel ads in giant nickel and for buying we buy houses and he'd take me on the points and he see hey see how i did that see how i solved their problems see how i helped them and he's a healer right so he's always helping people and he always instilled yeah. in me you never screw anybody this is why you're we're helping yes. them and so and, i think and that's a great thing too that you know and you mentioned this and talking about building those ethics and children and everything we for me at least you know i grew up in idaho everybody when i grew up I couldn't go anywhere and do anything wrong because everybody know, knows and I knew you'd get caught, right? Yeah. Um, but so there was this installed because there was no separation mm -hmm. where it was like business and family or church or what I, it was all together. Character was very important mm -hmm. because how I act here, I act there. Yep. There's no two AJs. There's yeah. no three AJs, right? There's no, when I when we're around, we act and we hold up to who we are. We hold those values. And um, that's really important to business. And that's yeah. the forefront because business is based upon trust. Yep. And those are short term things that you talk about like losing trust or whatnot. So me, like you, my dad installed that into me very early on. Mm -hmm. um, and that helped me tremendously um, when starting and working with others that you could build long lasting re uh, relationships that need to benefit both sides. And if it doesn't, it's not a good deal. Yeah. My business partner, he's, I got, he's got kids my age. And so we've been partners for four years. He um, and other people, they always say, you know, I'll cut the pie. You get to choose. So if I'm cutting a pie with the partner, somebody I want to go partner with, and I know that I'm giving myself a bigger slice. Well, if you choose, you better make sure you're fit. You're cutting that pie correctly. Cause the other person gets to choose or how, yeah. yeah or, I mean, but we you call those business. shotgun provisions, yeah, so or, shotgun provisions and contracts, yeah. buy sell arrangements yeah. where you say the one person says, okay, I want to sell the other person says, uh, or so if there's, if you say, I want you out and I want to buy it, right. The other person has to write down the number of what it sells for. Then that person gets the op opportunity to either agree or reverse it. Yeah. So, you know, whatever thing, so if you wanted to screw them say, okay, I'll sell it to you for $10 million and it's worth five, they can reverse it. And then you have to, then you now have to pay the 10 million. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's yeah. the same thing. Cutting the pie that buy sell agreement, make sure that when you leave both people are coming into it saying I could either be a buyer or a seller. So this needs to be equitable. Yeah. It, yeah. And, uh, and that's, but you know, you want to work with good people and I, like Cole and Tucker is the nice thing is you want to like, say I bring to the day, well, I'm trying to do some development stuff and I'm bringing at least these guys. Well, if they're going to do the, de the land development and the build the houses, I don't deserve 50% of this. Like I should be uh, ethical and say, I only deserve this much because that's all the value I brought. Cause then they're going to want to work with you long-term. So you have to be able to not only justify your value, but also have a good idea of what actually, how much value you brought to the table in my yeah. Being self-aware is really, really important. I think when you don't work a lot with adults and you don't, you don't understand how those inner workings work, that's a huge disadvantage mm -hmm. that you're not self-aware. And so you can't cut good deals and you can't work with people because you either vastly overestimate your personal value because yeah. you know you just got trophies all the time or whatever and you were yeah. never, you you never had inside exactly <laughs> for participating. Um, if participating exactly so you 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 over inflate your value then nobody wants to do deals with you um and so going in i like to say you know give more than you get and if you do that you'll always come out on top yeah i think you do that really well cole by the way i mean you're wise beyond your years i think uh, you I could gonna, test uh, that uh, I was going to say, I think that came from like, I was raised in my parents, my, my mom's an agent, but her and my dad are both involved in it. And I was involved in that business from 12 years old, going to open houses, being around business and negotiation and people and learning that you don't have an inherent, like you have value as a person, but in the business world, you don't, you aren't owed anything. Just yes. Your, 
you. Like you, no one's just a special, unique person who's owed mm -hmm. stuff. So, I mean, I, early on, it was, you got to learn how to talk to people, how to have a real conversation, how to be ethical. That's the biggest thing that I think takes people down long-term is all you have the reputation. Like if I screw one person over, even in Washington, I mean, it's a pretty small, the people that actually are doing yeah. a lot of business, it's a pretty small um, community of people. Um, so I think it's every huge, industry is yeah. so small. I mean, in, in the self storage world, we all know the players that you don't, you don't yeah. do deal with. everybody. It's just open knowledge, that's, right? That's, that's for every industry. Yeah. And so, I mean, if you want to be in like, people that want to be in real estate, even if you're just starting out and you think it's not important because it's your third deal and you want to get an extra five grand on a deal, but you're kind of doing something shady, it never plays out well long-term. Never. Yeah. And those guys never come. I see these guys come in and out all the time. All the they time. They never stick they around. Ever. Yep. You know, the guy that, you know, they say one thing and they do another, or I get calls all the time off my marketing. These people, they'll, they, they, two days before closing, these wholesalers are trying to say, oh, we need $30,000 off the, the deal or else we're not going to close on it. It's just like, excuse me, but fuck you guys. I mean, it's like, I get called, I got like three or four calls this year. So anyway, man, we've taken so much of your time. Why don't you wrap it up? Maybe, maybe Cole, if Cole has anything else to add, but like kind of where's AJ going? How can our community, uh, how can Cole and I support you? hopefully get those leads cranking up even more. Um, and what can we do and where are you going? And, and uh, you have a book too, right? So how do we, how, oh, yeah. how do people buy that book? Yeah. I, um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I love the assets that we've done. I, I love business finance and everything because of what it's done for me in my life with uh, becoming paralyzed. It saved, I, it saved my family's financial life. It literally did. And so I'm very passionate about these things. Um, so we wanted to expand that to more people. And that's why we created the Pirate of Equity side so people could come and invest alongside us and they could achieve that financial freedom themselves. Um, and it was off a proven model that I already made all the mistakes on it. So those things were very important. And we're like, hey, we're in a position where we can do this. Let's do it. And um, that's really our focus right now is expanding that. Um, I diversify into other businesses and everything, but I have good operators that uh, run those and I'm at our arm's length. Um, but really the um, private equity side, we're, we're, we've got six, seven deals and we're trying to get, uh, our average deal is right 80,000 square feet, um, somewhere between six and 15 million. And we are trying to get about two to three of those a quarter uh, through the next year. We have four on the plate right now and then hopefully pick up two more. Um, but that's where we're going. We're trying to build a, a very large portfolio and allow other people to participate in those assets, not just ourselves. Um, but the book, I, I so I wrote a book because there wasn't a lot of good information on storage and it seemed like every book was somebody just touting what they did. And then at the end said, you know, buy my course. Or whatever. <laughs> and so um, I just said, hey, we need a, a, we need a book that's just a playbook, right? Yeah. A complete playbook on how to do everything in this. And um, it was like, Cole, it was actually Brandon. When we were uh, at Brandon's house, um, he 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 was the one that said- That guy throws out ideas. He just, I, I know, we, he just throws we, them out. Dude, we, sat, like, oh, we sat we'll talking to him in Lake Chelan till like 3.30 in the morning. And we just go back and you just don't want to leave him because he's a but gift that keeps on giving. Idea, 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 idea. Yeah. I don't know because since that I've I had to start a private equity company and write a book. So <laughs> yeah. give a lot of ideas, but yeah. it comes with a lot of work. Yeah, so. your, your wife might like not like him as much. <laughs> and you're not gonna go hang out with him anymore. <laughs> so three businesses later. Um, but uh yeah, the book's growing wealth and self-storage and just made it uh it's the investor's guide to growing wealth and self-storage, and it's just a step-by-step -step playbook and how to get started, everything about it how to find value underperforming assets and how to turn them around. Um, it's literally just exactly our business model. I just wrote it all down. Um, so it's on Amazon. So you can buy it on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. And it was the number one seller for, I don't know if it's still, but it yeah, was for, for a long time. time. Yeah. And now is that through bigger pockets or is that? Um, nope. 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 I, I started a publishing company and just self published it. And we've got a couple other books we're publishing. So it's nice. build, you go to school, build a school, you need to publish a book. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's so Be crazy. a producer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, all right, cool, man. Well, I, man, I just know we appreciate you coming on so much. Um, I do have one question. I asked these guys yeah. that are in the private equity where, cause I talked to this guy on, went, where do you see um, the not political, but where do you yeah. see the monetary and asset classes going in the next 10 years? I've talked to guys that think inflation is going to asset inflation is going to be a lot bigger in the next decade. And also there's, if there is a chance um, if the, 
Fed or the Treasury defaults on any uh, Treasury bonds that we go to a multi currency, uh, multinational no. currency. What are your I'm thoughts get into on why that's not going to happen? Okay, so first of all, before I even get started, bonus on content, news, guys. This is bonus. I have no idea. Okay, this is just the first thing that needs to happen. I have no clue. Okay. Anybody that tells you that they do, yep. run away. Now you get all my opinions. Okay, yep. so. Um, <laughs> First off, it, it, we have been in a massive inflationary cycle since 2008 with the assets. The inflation that assets have seen have been nothing but just ginormous. Um, there is a lot of ratios that are no longer in line. Um, when you look at cost to income in rental housing, um, in lots of markets, it's no longer sustainable. Um, you're seeing drops um, in those in a lot of areas. Um, when you look at uh, the stock's performance in comparison to the revenue generated, multiples are extremely high. Um, this doesn't mean they're not going to go up. In fact, I think that they will. But two, you also have to realize we're not in a normal capitalistic society. We are in a central bank economy, right. not a capital. Everything is being paid for by the government. And right now, the government doesn't think that we can survive a month without a trillion dollar injection. So those are things that make me say, hey, the, you know, this is kind of troubling. Now, with that said, I'm totally bullish. I'm building and buying as long as it's on really good fundamentals. I don't guess and I don't make weird projections. I need to be able to see the money that's sitting on the table now. And that's my profit. Yeah, because good economy, people are buying shit. And they need a place to store it. Bad economy, they're losing their house. They need a place yep. to store their shit. Same yep. thing, self storage. And in a good economy, I'm buying, uh, I'm buying good deals. In a bad economy, I'm buying, that doesn't ever change. I don't change my criteria. Um, but what I do think is that we've a uh, moral hazard that we were worried about in 2008, which they had to do. They had to bail out the banks or we would have lost our economy. But the moral hazard with that, we're now seeing that. We're now seeing a government that, an economy that can't live without their government. Um, that has fundamentally changed the way our, our economy will work. Whether it goes back or not, I don't know. I don't know if there will ever be a time that we're not you massively in debt and going off. No, you can't turn it around. So I think that there will be uh, a gradual appreciation. I do not think we're losing the US dollar. And every time that argument gets up in, in 2008 and in the last 12 months, the world has become more dependent on dollars. So our central bank swaps, and that's how much yeah. money they're giving to other countries to fill out their balance sheets, have increased higher than they've ever increased before in this last cycle. That means the world has become more dependent on dollar than ever. China has showed us that with what they're doing in Hong Kong, they are not to be trusted. And then the rest of the currencies like the euro and everything, the Europe, I mean, yeah, the you Euro got can't Greece, even get the Greece. Well, yeah, the, the thing is failed. the US love it or hate us. I read a great book called uh, The Confessions of an Economic Hitman about, and it's a fantastic book. But, um, you know, we've done a really good job placing federal reserves and all these, you know, central banks and all these that then our Fed is like the king. Right. So we feed yes. their, their it's the we, central bank of the world. Yeah, yeah we're it basically the, the central spot. bank. Like they can't live without us because we placed our little no. little men in every freaking country. Well, and we make up so much of the world's GDP that if that ends, they all end too. So right now, I do not see that changing. And people that are calling for the death of the dollar, I don't see that. Because how can you, call, because there, there's this idea that, that countries are not going to want the dollar anymore, but they're taking more dollar than they ever have before. Mm -hmm. So that, I, I just don't understand how that makes sense. Now, with that said, moving on, there's obviously mass, massive unrest and uh, uh, things going on within the United States that is due to economic disparity, which is not necessarily being solved anytime soon, but coronavirus kind of put that all on front and center that there is that and that created a lot of problems on both sides. I'm not saying politically either yeah. one side or not. Both sides are not happy. Nobody is happy right now. Um, and, but this is an economic thing. So when we're looking in the future, we say there are a tale of two cities in the United States. Some areas will do well, why others will not. And we are very picky. Um, it, this is not like, you know, if you go, go back in the, the last big boom and cycle, where basically everywhere in the United States yeah. did good. We don't see that. Um, we've shifted our behavior and our changes and other assets will not play out like, uh, they have done in the last cycles and real estate has been in the biggest change in the last 30 years and then in, in the history of the world. And so a lot of the fundamentals regarding a real estate asset classes have changed. You look what we thought of home and retail. And in the last 15 years, retail yeah. used to be considered like a government bond and homes could never drop in price. 
both of those things went away. So there's been a framework in capital and adjustment. Um, and I think those things will all change. But if I'm looking out 10 years, none of my strategies are changing, right? I don't care who the president is. They come and go, right? Yeah. Then none of that matters. Um, I worry corrupt. about- Both sides are corrupt anyway. Yeah, I mean, that they, stuff- They're self-serving. The whole politicians are self-serving, so it doesn't matter. Yep. I worry about um, the erosion of the capitalistic system that is in place and that that will continue to suffocate overall GDP and returns and that there will be stagnated parts of the United States, which will create further economic disparity. But once again, I'm just literally talking here. It's like, I'm no, just- I, I, I do, so. I find this, and I, I'm sorry, <laughs> you, could, you could stop anytime. I, I find this so fascinating yeah. because really you, you're you looking at, you know, the Fed, with the Fed turning off the um, inflation, you know, 2%, they're, they're one now they do the average of 2%. So you wonder, okay, where do I get yield? Do I get yield in multifamily? Do I yield in single family? Is it self storage? Is it is it mobile homes? Uh, is there a repositioning of commercial like you know Amazon? You buying? get yield on good deals. Yeah. And this is I don't blanket any asset class, right? You can go into at least six markets in the United States right now in self storage, and you're gonna fail. Um, and the same with multifamily and every other asset class. Micro invest, macro themes. So you need to think macroeconomics when judging long end courses, right? So that was one of the reasons we got into storage because we said the economics behind storage is going to play out very well in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. But I didn't make that decision when I bought a deal. Yeah. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. So micro, all I care is about the local economy, the local market, what's fueling it, what's funding it, what the value ratio is and the upside of those deals. That's what I look at. Nothing else. Gotcha. Cool. All right, guys. Oh, he's taking too much time to, as always, I get talking. So Cole, anything to add real quick? Oh man. I, uh, I, I, I highly recommend giving AJ a follow on Instagram or Facebook. Yeah. He, put, he has an awesome podcast himself. Uh, two of them, right? AJ. Yeah. One on self storage and then one on all this other stuff we talk about. <laughs> oh man. I'd love, I uh, man, I don't know if you, yeah, maybe I'm not, you know, I'm not Harvard educated or anything, but you know, I, I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> so anyway, Go ahead and stay on, AJ. We'll just turn all the stuff off. But man, I appreciate you so much for your time today. And everybody, go give his book a like. Check it out. Um, you know, look at your fund. What's your fund? Uh, what's the fund name? Cedar Creek Wealth is is that. And if you go to Instagram, AJ Osborne, I, I post behind the scenes everything we're doing on there, so you can follow and click into it. Cool guys, awesome. Thanks so much, AJ, and uh, see you next time.